Hello Saints and welcome to today's study. Thanks uh, for studying with me. In this video we're going to be taking a look at a very important question that's been sent to me a while back and the question is what is the partial rapture theory? So in today's study we're going to be looking at uh, three different areas in this teaching called the partial rapture theory. The first thing we're going to look at is we need to define what the partial rapture is. Second, we're going to look at why do people believe in this teaching to begin with. And third, uh, what does God's word, rightly divided, have to say about the partial rapture theory? Now, we know that the only way we can find the truth is to rightly divide the word of our Lord God and we need to understand what dispensations are dispensations being how God has been dealing with the body of Christ since the time of Paul we're talking about this dispensation all the way to uh, from Paul all the way up to how he's dealing with us today and all the way up to the rapture now, I highly suggest if you don't understand what dispensations are, please take a look at the seven part series on my channel and get a, at least a basic understanding of what dispensations are all about. Because to be honest, without understanding dispensations, there's no way you'll ever understand God's word, period. And I really mean that. So the first thing we need to do in this study is define what the partial rapture theory is now the partial rapture theory is a theory that says when the rapture takes place only the really good Christians will be taken up in the rapture and the Christians that aren't so good will be left behind to endure the seven-year tribulation period also known uh, correctly as Daniel's 70th week now the problem with this theory is that it's completely false and it's not supported by the Word of God whatsoever but it's important that we study this because uh, this this teaching is gaining momentum uh, in today's Christendom it's gaining momentum in today's teachings as well as all the other false teachings because the closer we get to our catching up, the closer we get to the harpazo that our beloved Apostle Paul talked about, the more we're going to start seeing false teaching. Okay, The enemy wants to push as much false teaching as he possibly can to keep as many people here after the rapture. All right, So we're looking at what the partial rapture theory is and I explained it basically as the teaching teaches that simply the good Christians will be raptured the bad Christians will be left behind so why do people believe this teaching in the first place now like all the other false teachings out there in the world today the common denominator is the lack of right division and understanding of dispensations like I said and we read in Timothy where Paul writes to Timothy something very important study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth now we know according to right division and dispensations that the books pertaining to the body of Christ that's us folks for today are Paul's books Paul wrote 13 books Romans through Philemon and only in these 13 books will you find the details that pertain to us the church today all the other books the Old Testament the four Gospels uh, Hebrews to Revelation are all about God's dealing with the nation of Israel the promises that he's made to Israel those books contain all the prophecies written to and for them the nation of Israel so we see that God deals with the body of Christ through Paul specifically through the mysteries 
that our Lord Jesus revealed to Paul throughout his ministry. And God deals with Israel through prophecies, specifically the prophecies revealed to the prophets, the apostles, and so on. So now, now does that mean we should only pay attention to Paul's books and ignore the rest of them? Absolutely not. The entire Bible, all 66 books are given to us for our learning and understanding, but only 13 books are given for us today to the body of Christ. This is all basic right division and understanding of dispensations, okay? So to get back to our point, why do people believe in the partial rapture theory? Why is this happening? Well, here's why. By not rightly dividing God's word and by not understanding dispensations, okay, they look at all the books outside of Paul's books and they put themselves inside of the books written to the nation of Israel, Israel's books. The books that have nothing to do with the body of Christ today or this dispensation, the dispensation of grace. Now, partial rapture believers, they put the body of Christ inside the four gospels. They put the body of Christ inside uh, the books, the book of James, Peter and Jude, the book of Revelation. And even some of them put the church inside of the Old Testament. They, they take the parables and, and all the, the Proverbs that our Lord Jesus spoke in the four Gospels. And they make them pertain to us when they're not for us. Okay, But they're all about the nation of Israel. Now, an example of what they're doing is in the parables. Uh, the first parable... Uh, that they're not rightly dividing is the parable of the wheat and tares. They believe that the wheat here represents the body of Christ, but in truth, by right division, we know that Jesus was talking about the second coming. Specifically, he's talking about what happens at the second coming a and how first he would send his angels, okay, he comes down with his angels, uh, and the first thing he does is he sends a group of those angels to gather up the tares, the unbelievers. Then he sends the other angels to gather up the wheat, the believers. And he ushers the believers into the earthly kingdom that's promised to the nation of Israel. In Matthew 13, 24, where our Lord Jesus is talking about uh, in his parable concerning the kingdom. And, and in this parable, Jesus is talking about a man the sower who'd sown good grain or wheat in a field and when thin when they started growing they noticed the workers in the field they noticed that the enemy had sown uh, weeds or tares um, also amongst the wheat and at that point the workers ask what they should do about the situation okay and they offer a suggestion of pulling out the weeds or the tares to let the wheat grow alone without any problems but notice what the sower says uh, to them in Matthew 13 29 to 30 in verse 29 but he said nay lest while ye gather up the tares ye root up also the wheat with them in verse 30 let both grow together until the harvest and in time of harvest I will say to the reapers now the reapers here are the angels Gather ye together first the tares, okay? The first word, uh, the, uh, the word to remember here is and gather together first the tares, okay? That's the first thing he's going to gather up, the unbelievers. The angels will gather the unbelievers first at the second coming, all right? And he says, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn okay drop down to verse 36 then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field now here they're asking Jesus to explain this to them they didn't understand it <clears throat> to give them uh, the interpretation of that parable and he answers and he says to them 
He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Now Jesus is telling them here that the farmer who had planted the wheat is himself, Jesus, God in the flesh. In verse 38, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Okay, the good seed here being the righteous who make it through Daniel's 70th week and are ushered into the earthly kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The tares being the unrighteous ones. Those who uh, are not believers, the ones who take the mark of the beast, the, the ones that have fallen away, uh, the ones who refuse to believe, and so on. In verse 39, the enemy, okay, God's enemy, Satan, that sowed them, them being the tares, the unbelievers, the wicked ones, is the devil, okay, and the harvest is the end of the world, meaning the end of the age or dispensation, okay, the end of Daniel 70. Again, here's that word, a dispensing of God's program when it comes to an end at the end end of Daniel's 70th week or just after the great tribulation also known as Jacob's trouble and the reapers are of course the angels now in verse 40 as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire so shall it be in the end of this world again this is at the end of the age or dispensation not when the earth or heaven are destroyed okay uh, you have to read it in context, and in order to do that, you have to rightly divide, like like I said earlier. In verse 41, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. Verse 42, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who hath ears to hear let him hear now what jesus is saying here in this parable is this that at the second coming again at the end of the age which is immediately after daniel's 70th week christ jesus will send his angels into the world and they will gather out of the world the tares the unbelievers those who took the mark, those who rejected Jesus, and they will be cast into a horrible place of judgment. Then Jesus continues and he says that the righteous, those are the believers, they're going to be taken into the barn. Okay, And the barn here uh, is the earthly kingdom where they're going to remain for a thousand, the thousand year millennium. All right, They're going to be able to get married, have children. Uh, they're going to be repopulating the earth for those thousand years because during Daniel's 70th week, God is going to make mankind as rare as fine gold. All right, A lot of people will die. And we see by rightly dividing that this parable of the wheat and tares has absolutely nothing to do with the body of Christ. Now another parable uh, that partial rapture theorists tend to get wrong is the parable of the virgins so let's look at that Matthew 25 verse 1 through 13 uh, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom and five of them were wise and five were foolish they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps while the bridegroom tarried they all slumbered and slept and at midnight there was a cry made behold the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said unto the wise give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Now afterwards came also the other virgins, 
saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now in this parable, it's been largely taught uh, as applying to the church age saints, that being us right now. But when we rightly divide and apply the scriptures in, in context, we'll see how this interpretation is absolutely false. It has nothing to do with us today, the body of Christ. In this parable, Jesus is speaking about the tribulation saints in the 70th week of Daniel, specifically the nation of Israel. And the timing is at the second coming. This parable doesn't in any way apply to the church, the body of Christ, today. Okay, we're going to be gone at this point. The rapture would have happened seven years earlier. So this is at the second coming. And Jesus is dealing with those that are on the earth at the second coming. Okay, now let's look closer at the context. Look at the very first word, then. Then refers back to the original topic Jesus was talking about to the Jews here. The disciples asked Jesus back in Matthew 24, tell us when these things will happen. What will the signs look like and at the end of the world? They're asking Jesus about the second coming here. The term end of the world isn't the end of the world, but it's translated from the end of this age, referencing the second coming. Now keep in mind, the disciples are Jewish, okay? We're here in the dispensation of the kingdom. And Jesus is telling them he wouldn't be setting up the earthly kingdom just yet, but later on. And we see this in Matthew 21, 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. All right? Now, keep in mind also, Christ hadn't died yet. The church hadn't been created yet. And if you look back at verse 43, 2140, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 21, 43, where he says, And given to a nation that's singular, not nations. If, it's, if it would be written as nations, then we could assume that he's talking about the Gentiles, all the nations, okay? But here it says, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. The nation here being the, the little flock, the believing Jews, okay? In this context, Jesus was talking and he says that those who were taking care of Jerusalem at the time weren't worthy. So the kingdom would be taken from them and it would be given to the little flock, okay? that was Peter and the apostles and the believing Jews at the time. All right, it's important we keep this in context. So keep in mind, again, Christ hadn't died yet, the church hadn't been created yet, and Israel knew nothing of the gospel of grace at this point. It was still a, a, a secret mystery to be revealed to Paul and by Paul later on. Now, the disciples had no idea that what Jesus was talking about would happen 2,000 years into the future. This was still hidden in God at this point. Now, we know that the only place the church is seen is in Paul's books, like I mentioned earlier. Ro Romans through Philemon. All right? That's it. Period. And nowhere in Paul's books is the church called the wife, the woman, or a virgin. Nowhere. You won't find it. The church doesn't have to worry about how much of the Holy Spirit it has. We, the body of Christ, have 100% of the Holy Spirit from day one. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit from the first day, the first moment of your salvation. So this parable can't be talking about the church here. It has to be referring to the Jews, the kingdom saints, in the tribulation period just prior to the second coming. Now, keep in mind... The dispensation of grace, our salvation, will end at the rapture. Then a new dispensation, a new method of salvation, will once again start up. Not a totally new method of salvation, but it's going to be faith plus works. Just like it was 
back when Peter, the apostles, and Jesus were walking the earth together. It's separate and different than our gospel today. Okay, so it's going to be plus works, and they'll have to endure till the end of the of the Daniel 70th week. And some are going to make it, having done works, having faith, all the way to the second coming. And some won't make it. They're going to fall victim to the tricks of the Antichrist. They're going to fall away when God causes them to believe the lie that the Antichrist is God. The grand delusion poured out on those that refuse to believe in the first place. That is their punishment for not believing. They're going to be fooled and tricked into believing that the Antichrist is God and that's where the falling away takes place. So already we see a picture of some virgins or Jews making it to the second coming and some Jews who won't make it and we're already seeing the parable uh, that Jesus is is talking about here where the ten virgins half not making it till the end okay and half will now another confusion that arises from not rightly dividing is over the parable concerning the one that says as in the days of Noah two in the field one will be taken and one will be left in Matthew 24 we see that verse 37 to 41 but as, but as in the days of Noah were so shall also the coming of the son of man be for as in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them now notice the word them and took them all away so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What is Jesus talking about here? Now what he's saying here, the order at the second coming of our Lord Christ Jesus, right after the 70th week of Daniel, the order will be identical to the order that took place back in Noah's day at the flood. Notice in verse 39, the flood came and took them away. So I ask you, which group of people were taken away from the earth when the flood came? Was it the believers or unbelievers? The flood removed the unbelievers of Noah's day from the earth in judgment. They were all killed. And the believers in that day, Noah and his family, eight of them, were left here on the earth in the ark to go into the next period or the dispensation of world history after the flood. So after pointing this out, Jesus says at the end of verse 39, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, it will be the same order of things at the second coming as it was back in the days of Noah. And to illustrate that, he goes on to verses 40 and 41. Then the second coming after the, the 70th week of Daniel shall two be in the field the one shall be taken and the other left two women shall be grinding at the mill the one shall be taken and the other left now the question is who is the one taken from the field and the one taken from grinding at the mill if it's the same order then as it was back in the days of Noah's flood and the flood took all the unsaved away and Jesus says it will be the, it's going to be the same order at the second coming then we're forced to conclude that the ones taken away here are not believers they're not saved so then accordingly the unbelievers are taken away okay they're taken away by the holy angels that are sent to remove them they're taken to judgment Remember earlier the tares. These are the unbelievers. It says, first gather ye the tares. So the angels will first gather up the unbelievers and bring them to judgment. And then he gathers up the wheat, the believers, and puts them into his barn or the earthly kingdom. All right? So we see that one is left in the field, uh, and that one left at the mill. Also, these are believers, 
and they're left on the earth and they're going to go into the next period of God's plan and they'll be brought into the kingdom on earth. So we see how Noah and his family was spared but the world was removed and taken away from the earth in judgment. Now it's going to be the same order here at the second coming. Those taken are removed from the earth in judgment and those left behind are those that will be ushered into the earthly kingdom. Now to really set this in stone we need we, we look at another passage talking about the same event over in Luke Luke 17 but there's more added to this okay there's more explanation to this in Luke 17 26 this is another parallel passage okay where Jesus is speaking about the very same thing the nature and order of events at the second coming look at 26 and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remembers Lot, Lot's wife, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Notice this is the same teaching that Matthew records in Matthew 24, but here in Luke, Luke records something more than Matthew. They ask the Lord a question. They want to know where the ones taken are taken to okay they already understand what happens to those who are left here on earth but they're confused as to where these people are being taken to the other ones so here in verse 37 of Luke 17 we read and they answered and said unto him where Lord and and he said unto them wheresoever the body is thither will the eagles be gathered together now eagles are vultures they're they're prey that eat rotting flesh they eat dead flesh so what Jesus is saying is this you want to know where these people are going they're being removed to the realm of death and that's where the ones being removed are taken to death to judgment to where there's gnashing of teeth and so on and their dead bodies will be moved to another location here on earth where the birds of prey will feast on their flesh until they're all gone Okay, and we know this event as the marriage supper of the Lamb, the great supper of God, when the birds of prey who eat flesh will have their great supper of God eating those that didn't believe. So we see here more of this, that the order of things that happen here immediately after the second coming, after Daniel's 70th week, the seven year tribulation, are going to be exact opposite in order than the rapture okay which happens prior to those seven years prior to Daniel's 70th week at the rapture the believers we are the ones being removed from the earth and the unbelievers are left behind they're left on the earth to deal with the famine the death the antichrist pure hell on earth so we see the opposite here in the order of the ones removed at the second coming. And because of the opposite nature of the rapture and the second coming, it's proof that they have to happen at two different times. First the rapture, then Daniel's 70th week, then the second coming. So rightly dividing God's word, we know that the rapture happens first, again, the tribulation period, seven years Daniel's 70th week then after seven years the opposite of the rapture happens and the wicked are removed and the believers are left to enjoy the kingdom to repopulate the earth for the millennial reign of Christ 
and we're talking about the nation of Israel here and they're going to be here for a thousand years of Christ Jesus' rule on earth and also with the promise that the apostles will rule over the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel okay so we've looked at just three of these parables these proverbs where our Lord shows us what's going to take place during the end days okay and for who for the nation of Israel that's right for the nation of Israel not the body of Christ at the time these parables were spoken the body of Christ was still a mystery and hadn't even been revealed to Paul yet Paul wasn't even saved at this point so why uh, you know because at this time the nation of Israel still had a chance to repent as a nation to believe that Jesus was their Messiah and this would have led God to usher in the kingdom of heaven immediately at that point upon the earth in fact we know God gave them an extra year above and beyond their crucifixion to still receive the earthly kingdom through Stephen he was their last chance the last prophet but they killed him also they stoned poor Stephen and that was the end of their chances so the partial rapture theory has everything to do with not understanding who the nation of Israel is and not rightly dividing and not understanding dispensations and putting the body of Christ where it just doesn't belong and like I said many times before the common denominator with all these false teachings are groups of people who teach religion and tradition instead of teaching God's word rightly divided in order to understand the Bible folks you have to learn what dispensations are without that you're gonna to be tossed to and fro uh, with every wind of doctrine out there and you're just gonna be confused over and over again and you're not gonna understand what God's plan is for the body of Christ so now we've gone over the definition of the partial rapture theory we've gone over why people get caught up in the partial rapture deception uh, we need to go over the facts concerning the church and the truth about our harpazo, our catching up, and our rapture. Now, the only place in God's Word that you're going to find anything having to do with our rapture are in Paul's books. And the reason why the rapture is only in Paul's writings is because the rapture is part of the mystery that Jesus revealed to Paul during his ministry. You're not going to find anything about the body of Christ being raptured outside of Paul's books. Romans through Philemon. <clears throat> Trying to find the body of Christ uh, or the rapture outside of Paul's books leads to false teachings. Just like the partial rapture theory. And here we've been discussing what, the partial rapture theory. And we can see clearly why not understanding dispensations and what happens. So the biggest problem with that teaching and those who practice it is the belief that works must be added to faith in order to be saved in Christ Jesus and we know this is false in Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10 for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them now notice <clears throat> in verse 10 a lot of people take this verse out of context and they try to make it sound like you need to do good works in order to be saved that's not what this is saying read it again for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto the word unto here is the key to understanding unto good works once we're saved then we can perform good works not the other way around in Titus 3 verse 4 to 7 but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost 
which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The rapture of the church is simply God closing out the age of grace by removing us, the church, the body of Christ, so that he can then go back and then he begins his prophetic program for the nation of Israel. God must first remove us, the righteous ones, the church, the body of Christ, who possess the righteousness of Christ, as he cannot and will not unleash his wrath on us, righteous believers. He has to remove us. So in Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. In Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, that's us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. In 1 Thessalonians 1.10 And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. In 1 Thessalonians 5.9 For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now also, Paul tells us that the restrainer, the one that withholdeth, must be removed before the Antichrist can come to power, before he's given power to rule over the earth. And we know what's keeping the restrainer restrained right now, the Holy Spirit-filled body of Christ. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 5 to 7, remember ye not, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. He here being the body of Christ which is filled with the Holy Spirit. So how can there be some members of the Holy Spirit filled body of Christ still on earth after the rapture and some members taken. That would mean that part of what restrains the Antichrist would still be left here after the rapture. Again, the partial rapture theory makes no sense at all and it's clear when you rightly divide the Word of God. So every member of the body of Christ, every member whether faithful or not so faithful, all possess the same righteousness in Christ Jesus. And we all possess what's holding back the Antichrist from coming to power. So we all must be taken off the earth. You see, the rapture of the church is not an event which is only for a select group of members of the body of Christ, but it is for all members who have been placed into the one body of Christ. In Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. You see that? in There is one body, not two. In 1 Corinthians 12.13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have made all made to drink into one spirit. In Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Also, we know that the body of Christ will be judged. Our judgment at the judgment seat of Christ will come after the rapture takes place. Immediately after the rapture. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all, you hear that? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone, everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 
Notice again, for we must all. So how can we all appear at the judgment seat of Christ if only some of us are going to be raptured? It doesn't make any sense. More proof that the entire body of Christ must be taken in the rapture. And it has to do with the judgment seat of Christ Jesus. Since the judgment seat of Christ will be at a time when all believers in Christ receive their rewards, then all rewards are given out, not just some of them. All right? There are no rewards put to the side for when the other group shows up. Uh, you know, the entire body of Christ will have to be present for the judgment seat of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire the words the day here is speaking of the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now Paul here clearly is telling us that those who attend the judgment seat of Christ will have good works and bad works to deal with. This indicates that there's going to be members who were extremely faithful and members who aren't so faithful. So, you know, but clearly we see both groups here at this event not just the very best of the best of the Christians. That's not what it says. We also see from the scripture that some believers will experience gain and some will suffer loss. But despite this, everyone, everyone is at this event and everyone at this event is saved. The only way a person can take part in the judgment seat of Christ is if they're in the body of Christ. They all have to be saved in order to attend this event. Notice also that the Apostle Paul says work in a singular fashion and not works with an S. Okay, and this is to show that each individual deed done for Christ will be examined and every member of the body of Christ will have some rewards. It's important to understand what the judgment seat of Christ is because there's 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 some people out there that don't understand dispensations and they love to say that those who believe once saved always saved think that they have a free gift of being able to sin whenever they want being able to to live any way they want to live and they're still always going to be saved and they say it doesn't make sense well in that sense, it wouldn't make sense if there wasn't a judgment seat of Christ for the body of Christ, okay? Because once we get saved as a believer in Christ, in the body of Christ, we are responsible and accountable for our actions, both good and bad. So you can't sit there and say, once saved, always saved, or those that believe they can, you know, just claim grace, grace, grace all the time and keep sinning. That's just not the case. Because the thing is, when a, per, when, a, when a believer in Christ either gets raptured or passes away from this earth, they're going to have to face the judgment seat of Christ. And if they live their life sinning as a Christian and really didn't take their relationship in Christ seriously, they're going to pay for it. And Paul tells us how they're going to pay for it. And folks, we don't know what these rewards are. The, you know, this is still part of the mystery. Some things Paul didn't really get into. But some of these rewards could be serious, very, very serious things. For an example, and this is just an example, hypothetically, what if one of the rewards is your ability to travel from heaven to the earth at the speed of thought. What if that's one reward? Could you imagine if that was taken away from you because you decided 
to live like the world as a Christian. And you were you wouldn't be able to come to the earth like the angels do. We know the angels can travel from the heavens to the earth as they wish with the permission of the Lord. So there's a good chance that we're going to be able to do the same thing. Now our responsibility is going to be over the heavenly government in Christ Jesus. We're not going to be on the earth solely on the earth for those thousand years with the nation of Israel because our inheritance is the heavens and that's where coming you know understanding dispensations is all about you understand that the nation of Israel inherits the earth and the body of Christ inherits the heavens but to get to my point you just don't know what the rewards are so you really 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 need to you know watch how you live as a Christian we are still very much accountable for every word that comes out of our mouths how we, we act uh, you know what we do on a daily basis whether we witness to people whether we you know go out and, and share the gospel all these things are being written down somewhere and will come up as soon as we stand before our Lord at the judgment seat of Christ his judgment seat that's where we're gonna answer for everything we do so some members are gonna have more rewards than others and it's clear that every member of the body of Christ is gonna have at least some rewards but again there's gonna be some taken away okay and we, and we know this 2nd Corinthians 517 therefore if any man in Christ if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You cannot be in Christ made into a new creature without producing fruit of righteousness. Okay, this would be a contradiction. So everyone in the body of Christ will get some type of reward. Now, another point to make about this is that God's Word clearly tells us that there's only one event called the Judgment Seat of Christ. Okay, there's only one. So, if the partial rapture theory was true, then when would those Christians be judged? Clearly, if they miss the rapture on the day of Christ, then they will also miss the Judgment Seat of Christ as well. Again, it makes no sense. Where in scripture does it tell us that there are two judgment seats of Christ for the church? Nowhere. Where in scripture does it tell us, uh, you know, that there are different bodies in Christ Jesus? Nowhere. If there was a partial rapture, then why would there need to be a judgment seat of Christ for the first group? Isn't the first group declared the cream of the crop by going up first? Why do they need to be judged? You see, again, it makes no sense when you rightly divide and you actually read the Bible instead of listening to traditional religious teachings. Another thing I've noticed about people who believe in this partial rapture theory is that they're always on the first list, okay? They all think they're in the first group who gets to be raptured prior to Daniel's 70th week. None of them who believe this theory tell you that they're going to be one of the ones that are left behind. All right. So, question, how unfaithful does a member of the body of Christ have to be before they're disqualified to take part in the rapture? How unfaithful do they really have to believe be no believer is perfect in their walk and character 100 percent of the time so there's obviously going to be less faithful believers who made the rapture who, who will still stand before the judgment seat of christ isn't there of course another question why is the cut where's the cutoff point how unfaithful does a believer have to be Again, there's no answer to those questions in Scripture because there's no such thing as the partial rapture theory in Scripture. There's no such thing. I would think that if there was any way a member of the body of Christ could be disqualified from the rapture 
Surely Paul would have said something about it. Surely God would have warned Paul to tell the saints, right? This would have been a major doctrine that Paul would have been teaching. He would have written about it as much as possible if people could miss the rapture and still be in the body of Christ, but he didn't, which means this doctrine doesn't, it doesn't exist in the mind of God and it neither existed in the mind of Apostle Paul. No member of the body of Christ, past, present, or future, was, is, or ever will be placed into the body of Christ by good works, by doing good works, but only by faith in Christ Jesus alone and the finished work <clears throat> of his death, burial, and resurrection. And there's no scripture that says a member of the body of Christ is ever removed from the body for any reason whatsoever. Once you're sealed in Christ, you're sealed forever. Forever means forever. Eternal life means eternal. The Holy Spirit will never leave the believer once they've been sealed. The Holy Spirit is a seal, okay? It's part of it, part of its job is to seal you. It is a down payment until you get to heaven. Ephesians 1:13, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit within the believer is the one who will quicken our bodies at the rapture. It's changed into a glorified body. Remember in Romans 8, 9 to 11, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, the translation of every member of the body of Christ who happens to be alive at the time of the rapture will be allowed entry into heaven. You see, members of the body of Christ who've already died in the past were allowed entry into heaven at the time of their physical death based on faith in Christ Jesus and the gospel, the completeness of his death, burial, and resurrection. We read that in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. God's righteousness never changes within the believer and neither is God's righteousness does it affect or is it affected by the believers lack of faithfulness you see it's his righteousness that makes us righteous not ours and since God is totally righteous uh, the believers spirit in Christ is therefore totally righteous right makes sense God's word tells us that the rapture is for the purpose of giving new bodies to the dead in Christ, which Jesus brings with him to meet us when we're changed and called up as well. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 to 18, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And those here that are asleep are the Christians who have died before us that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Therefore, every member who's already been placed in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit and sealed 
will be allowed entry into heaven at the time of the rapture. In Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The day of Jesus Christ here is the day of Christ, which is the rapture. Okay? It's the resurrection of the members of the in, in, in his body. Every one of us will be taken off the earth just prior to God turning his attention back to the nation of Israel. And we know this uh, as Daniel's 70th, 70th week. Some call it the seven-year tribulation period. Some call it the last half of it. They call it Jacob's trouble. But it is called in the book of Daniel the 70th week, which is a seven-year period. Now, remember, saints, the body of Christ is one body made up of individual members, and it cannot be dismembered at any time. Okay, since it was purchased by the perfect work of Christ and his shed blood, it was bought once. The entire thing. We can't work our way into this body, but we're placed into this body. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit at the very moment we're saved in Christ Jesus. In order to have a complete body, you need to have all the members, right? Of course. In Romans 12:4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. In Romans 12.5 So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. In 1 Corinthians 10.17 For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. 1 Corinthians 12.12 For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. You see, Paul kept pounding this and pounding this in their heads that they were just one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have made, been all made to drink into one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12.18 But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. Ephesians 2.16 And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Ephesians 4.46 There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And the list goes on and on and on. Paul continuously talks about the body of Christ as being one body made up of many members, one group, not two, not three, not four, not five, but one. So you see now why the partial rapture theory makes absolutely no sense at all. We've studied what the partial rapture theory is, why people are misled into believing it, and lastly we've looked at what God's Word does say about the body of Christ and the rapture, so be comforted saints. If you believe and trust in Christ Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, as outlined in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, for your salvation, you have nothing to worry about whatsoever. When our Lord determines when the time is right, and I believe it is soon, very soon, he's going to remove his entire body of believers at once. Then he's going to turn back to the nation of Israel for Daniel's 70th week. He's going to return at the second coming. He's going to usher in the earthly kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, and move the world into the 1,000 year millennial reign. So with that, my friends, I hope you enjoyed the study. I hope it was informative. Thanks for studying with me, saints. Peace, grace, and love in Christ Jesus be with all of you. And I'll see you on the next video, Lord willing.